Excessive heat on the West Coast, flash flooding in the nation's Northeast. We've been seeing extreme weather coast to coast. First Alert Chief Meteorologist Paul Hagen takes a closer, closer look at what's going on and what's ahead. Welcome to Weather Extra on CBS News Bay Area. I'm KPIX 5 meteorologist Paul Hagen. This is the space where we get a little nerdy. We take a deeper dive into some weather and climate topics, spend a little bit extra time compared to the time that we usually have allotted within our weather segments on KPIX 5. And this time around, I want to talk about some of the weather extremes that we have seen recently, regionally, nationally, and even globally, and then talk about what's coming up a little bit farther down the line. We'll start close to home with the the latest heat wave that gripped the Bay Area and is still ongoing for other parts of the region. The Bay Area is lucky. This isn't lasting too long, and we didn't get the worst of it. There were some triple-digit temperatures for inland parts of the Bay Area, but farther inland, temperatures are ranging in the 110 to 115 range on a widespread basis, especially in the San Joaquin Valley. And we're talking about some extreme temperatures elsewhere, close to 115 degrees in Las Vegas, approaching 120 in Phoenix, Death Valley getting up close to 130 degrees. When those spots that are already normally hot are abnormally hot. That tells you this is an unusual event. And while the heat has backed down around the Bay Area, it is not going to do so for other parts of the state, especially in the San Joaquin Valley and other parts of the region. The Desert Southwest is just going to be cooking under this heat dome for the next seven to 10 days at least. This has the fingerprints of climate change all over it. We can categorize that with what's called the climate shift index. This is something that Climate Central came up with to quantify how much more likely an extreme weather event becomes due to the influence of climate change. And for this particular heat event, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, parts of Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, certainly Texas, and then down to New Mexico, those climate shift index values are around a four or a five, meaning that this type of extreme heat is four to five times more likely because of the influence of climate change. Very Variabilities happen all the time, but climate change is the heavy foot on the accelerator. It's certainly not the only extreme event that we have seen. We've been tracking that Canadian wildfire smoke throughout the summer. Another batch of that smoke been blowing down over the last several days across the prairie provinces of Canada and into the northern United States, prompting more air quality alerts for the northern part of the country. All of that has avoided the Bay Area, but other parts of the United States have certainly been dealing with frequent air quality alerts and a lot of issues in that regard. We have also seen some extremes on the other side of the equation, too much water in a short amount of time. Recently, we had extreme flooding in the Hudson Valley of New York, also extended up into Vermont. This type of flooding, not something that the Granite State sees very often, but these types of extremes on both sides of the spectrum, whether it's extreme temperatures, extreme precipitation, become more likely because of the influence of climate change. And something that we've especially seen just within the past couple of decades, the number of extreme events has really just skyrocketed as because our temperatures have been going up and up as carbon dioxide levels and other greenhouse gases have been going up and up as well. But it's not just something that happens in the atmosphere. We've also been seeing the impact in our oceans. Close to the coast, the coastal waters off of Florida have been extremely warm, bathtub warm. Key West recently set a record by a lot for the warmest temperature. We're talking 95 to 97 degree ocean temperatures, which is extraordinarily unusual. And that also extremely heightens the risk of coral bleaching events, which are just underwater catastrophes. It's not confined to just those near shore areas. The entire North Atlantic Ocean set a record in the month of June for the warmest temperature on record, shattering the old record by about a half a degree Celsius. That is unusual for that expanse of water to be that warm for that long and to break the record by that much. That kind of warmth is reflected in the temperature pattern across the entire country, the entire globe. The global average temperature during the month of June also set a record. So we're back into the atmospheric part of this. Of course, the ocean helps to feed that since the atmosphere and the ocean border each other. Global temperatures in the month of June were the highest on record, about a degree and a half Celsius above the 1850 to 1900 average. And you can see how much that has increased. This is just for the month of June. This is data from berkeleyearth.org. Those numbers, again, just have been climbing and climbing 
but this is unprecedented even for the recent trend that we have seen. And on a daily basis, we've also been setting some records recently. This made news about a week or two ago with a stretch of the warmest temperatures recorded on a global average basis on record. In fact, it was an 11-day stretch where every one of those 11 days in the first half of July was warmer than any other day recorded, dating all the way back to 1979. Why 1979? Because that's when the weather satellite era begins. So we're looking at that kind of detailed data that we get from the weather satellites to look at places that ordinarily we don't have sensor data from. So we're only going back to 1979, an apples to apples comparison. There are plenty of other ways that we get temperature data dating back much farther than that. Observations that people have taken, but also looking at tree ring data, ice core data, we can go back thousands of years and kind of fill in the gaps. But daily data, that's what we have over the last four plus decades and we are in uncharted territory, and it's something that is unfortunately likely to continue as we head through the rest of this year. One of the reasons for that is a developing El Nino. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but I do want to show you just how widespread that warmth has been in the North Atlantic Ocean. On our globe here, we've highlighted abnormally warm ocean surface temperatures, sea surface temperatures, SSTs is what we call them because we love abbreviations in the science world. All the yellow, orange, and red indicates abnormally warm ocean surface temperatures. That's most of the northern half of the Atlantic Ocean, covered with those abnormally warm sea surface temperatures and in record territory beyond that. Of course, the focus for the rest of the year, we pivot to the Pacific Ocean, where that developing El Nino is continuing to strengthen. That stripe right along the equator of a lot of red with some orange kind of bordering it indicates abnormally warm temperatures in places where the ocean water is typically a little bit colder. That's the hallmark signature of El Nino, and it's pretty much locked in that this El Nino event is going to continue into the wintertime months is typically when it peaks. The question is, how strong exactly is it going to become? So we can estimate those values. Again, it's almost a 100% chance that we are going to be in El Nino conditions, defined as being one half a degree Celsius above normal ocean temperatures. But is it going to be a moderate El Nino? That's looking more likely, one degree Celsius above those normal ocean temperatures. One degree doesn't sound like a lot. It's a huge amount when you're talking about the size of the Pacific Ocean and the degree to which that throws off everything in the atmosphere above it. We're talking about an 80 plus percent chance it's going to be at least a moderate El Nino by late fall and early winter. And it's over a 50 percent chance this is going to be a strong El Nino, one and a half to two degrees Celsius above what is typical for that part of the ocean. That is something that is a significant concern because the stronger the El Nino event, typically the greater the kind of downstream effects of what happens through the rest of the atmosphere become. Let's talk about those specific impacts. And for the Bay Area, this can go either way. The reason that everything is thrown off by El Nino is because it affects how the jet streams in the atmosphere are aligned and how they behave. And specifically, we're talking about the Pacific jet, which tends to bring wetter than normal conditions during El Nino winters to the southern half of California and much of the desert southwest and along the Gulf Coast as well. The Bay Area is on the edge of this. We've had some El Ninos that bring extraordinarily wet conditions to the Bay Area. We've had others that bring either average or slightly below average rainfall during an El Nino winter. So this is something that could go either way for us, but it's made extra complicated this year by the fact that the rest of the climate system is kind of out of whack. And I can show you what that means by comparing a couple of global maps. This is the El Nino event that happened during the winter of 1997-1998. Again, you can see that signature of the warm stripe of ocean water over the eastern Pacific near the equator. That throws off everything that happens in the atmosphere above it, which throws off everything downstream. Let's compare that to the map of the developing El Nino now. You still see the signature of that stripe of abnormally warm water in the Pacific, but look at all of the other locations that have warmer than average sea surface temperatures, much of the northern Pacific. We talked about the northern Atlantic. The Indian Ocean has abnormally warm sea surface temperatures. So the question is, will this El Nino have its usual trickle-down effect, or does everything else developing elsewhere in the oceans and the atmosphere around the entire world Complicate, the thing, complicate, complicate things to a degree where we don't get the typical El Nino patterns that we expect, with wet conditions for Southern California, warm conditions in the Pacific Northwest, dry through the Tennessee and Ohio River valleys, or are we in just completely uncharted territory? Because when, again, you have all of these patches of warm water elsewhere in the world, 
maybe the El Nino event is going to have its usual impact of throwing off everything, or maybe this is going to throw things off to a greater degree. And this as well. And the warm water in the Indian Ocean is also going to throw another monkey wrench into the gears. This is something that really adds a lot of complexity to our efforts to try to predict exactly what's going to happen over the coming months. So again, with the impacts of climate change, we are somewhat in uncharted territory. What is likely is that because of all of this unusually warm ocean water, combined with the heat waves that we've had over land, 2023 is likely to go into the record books as the warmest year on record. And 2024 might be even warmer than that because of the lingering impacts of that El Nino event. Something we're going to continue monitoring over the coming months. If you have a weather or climate question that you want to ask us to answer here on Weather Extra, just send it to us at weatherextra at kpix.cbs.com.